Broadcasting live from the WGBB World Headquarters here in New York. This is the Big Fat Joey Show with your host, Big Fat Joey. Hey, send Big Fat Joey, Big Fat Joey Show, biggest thing on radio. What's up? Good morning. How are you? What a workout yesterday. Yes, what a workout with our buddy Stanny from One Fit Official, One Underscore Fit Official, mega trainer to the stars. He was at New York Fit Festival yesterday in Long Beach, Long Island, and I took one of his classes. It was a great class. He's so energetic. He makes it fun, but you know what? Working out in the sand at the beach and in the sun definitely puts a whole new spin to working out. It's like tenfold harder. I am so impressed. All I know is at one point you were like, I can't do anymore. I'm like, are you okay? It was hot. It was hot. My legs were burning. Uh, you know, it was just, but it was a fun exercise. It was fun. Uh, you know, like I said, on the sand, it's a lot different. You're on unsteady ground. And when you're running in the sand or doing uh, uh, squat thrusts or jumping jacks and things of that nature, it adds a different dimension. But it was such a great time. Great time. Catching Stanny's up with Stanny. The Stanny's the best. Once again, you want to work out with Stanny, check him out at OneFit underscore official because he also has online classes through his fitness partner, Neo U. So definitely check him out. But we have a great, great show today, son. So what's happening? We have singer, songwriter, and artist Michael Lazar with us today. He's going to be speaking with us about his new record that just came, his new album that is coming out on October 8th, 5149. And we're going to listen to a couple of his new songs, a few breaths away, dedicated to his mom, who unfortunately passed a few years back, and his remake of the hit Beach Boy song, Kokomo. Nice. Then we also have everyone's favorite restorer, Rick Dale from American Restorations on the History Channel. Rick speaks to us all about how he got involved in restoring, you know, especially Coke machines and all the different items he's restored throughout the years. Everything from your, your vintage toaster to a motorbike to space equipment, helmets, um, jetpacks that have gone out in space. So that's a great, great interview. So without any further ado, up next is my interview with the king of restorations, Rick Dale. All right, everyone, let's welcome to the line Master Restorer, Rick Dale of Rick's Restoration. Rick, how are you, Big Fat Joey? Hey, hey, Joey. I'm doing awesome, buddy. How's it going back there? Doing all right. You know, we were talking a little bit off air. It's like a swamp here in New York today in, uh, in this crazy summer weather. And you guys are out there in, in, hot, but it's a dry heat. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> come on out anytime. We'll cook some eggs on the sidewalk. I love. I love when I see those videos on on social media. People just cooking on, on the sidewalk, or I saw a video of people putting buying bags of ice to put in their swimming pool. Yeah, well, that's right. Lately, I I jumped in our pool yesterday, and it was ninety five degrees. And I have an ice machine there, and I just tipped it over into the pool. That it is so hot in the water; it's like it's not refreshing. So you got to do something. Yeah, no, you're, 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 you're in a slow simmer. You're about to be cooked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, Rick, you know, I, I'm, I'm fascinated with the show. Rick's Restoration was on the History Channel for about seven years. You're a mastery store. I've learned a lot from watching your show on not only what to look at. I'm a little bit of a collector, per se. You know, not, nothing crazy. But I, I do like to tinker, and I've learned a, a, you know, a lot of different things. But can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got involved in, in, in that business? You know, it's not a run-of-the-mill type. It's not like it's owning a deli or something like that. You know, you need to know a little bit about a lot. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't, uh, you know, I basically didn't go to school or anything. I um, it was just the hard knock way. I When I was like, I don't know, eight years old, uh, I wanted a bicycle, and my dad ended up uh, going, I don't know, he found an old beat-up bike somewhere, probably in a trash can. And he brought it home, and he told me if I want something, that I got to build it myself. Um, he's not going to give me, you know, just a brand-new bike like all the other kids in the neighborhood. So he gave it to me, and then I ended up, uh, you know, he'd take me to the, you know, Pet Boys, and we'd go down, and we'd 
get the paint, we get the bearings, and we get the grease and do this stuff. Come home, and um, he would help me like put it together. And then the next thing you know, I'm driving around the neighborhood, and I was probably the proudest kid out there with this awesome bike that I built, and everybody else had spot there. The parents bought there, so that was how I started. And then it led from there to he he got me into soapbox derbies. Uh, he got me into go kart driving. Um, and everything I was doing, I was building, mechanicing, fixing, learning. He, you know, my dad worked for uh, an electric company, Southern California Edison, and he, he was just, you know, like a station chief there, and he, he was an electrician, and he would just, him and his friend would bring stuff to me to, you know, make me happy or make me, you know, I guess give me something to do. And I had a brother too, Edison, so he had tractors at home and all these things were worked on. So I went through that part of my life, and then when I graduated, well, I did before I graduated high school, I ended up with a with a car, a Jeep, and I rebuilt that, and then I went from that to boat to, to all over, all kinds of things. So my dad sort of, I mean, I didn't give him credit while he was alive, but I'm definitely giving him credit now, because he, he taught me all these things, little at a time, and I took it for granted, and then all of a sudden one day, I decided to put it into a business. So then I ended up with Rich Restorations, but Rich Restorations didn't just happen either. It wasn't like I just wanted to, you know, start a business with Coke machines and restore them. I was in the business of, um, I did, I had equipment rental and I went in with a guy and had these heavy equipment. I would, we would rent them. And then all of a sudden I started operating equipment. I started doing big jobs. Well, then we ended up with having a problem with the company. It dissolved. Uh, I came home, and that was in, like, 1983. And next thing you know, I had to do something because I couldn't pay the house payment. So I had an old Coke machine in the backyard that I had bought from a guy. And uh, somebody said, hey, man, they sell those things in California at um, these swap meets. They're selling them down there to people in Japan and people in the Netherlands. I said, oh, cool. So I restored it up. I fixed it all up. And I took it down there. And that day I met uh, a guy from Japan who wanted to buy a hundred of them. And I also met a guy that had a hundred for sale that were unrestored. So the next thing you know, boom, I was in business and it, it got big quick. Um, it, it was just the boom of the nostalgia stuff, especially for Japan. And I was building them and sell on Japan as fast as I could. And then all of a sudden America finally caught on. And that was, you know, that was in 83. So the next thing you know, the show came out in 2010. So that was quite a while. I had a whole big run before the show came out. But that's how it got started. I told you I was long winded. No, <laughs> no, but you know, still there. <laughs> but that, that's a great story. I mean, especially, you know, your father was an electrician, so he had to be handy somewhat. You know, you don't just get into that line of work and not know a, a screwdriver right. from, from a, a hammer. But, you know, you took it to the yeah. umpteenth level. You know, you, you built that bike, and then, you know, finances it caused you to really look back on your, your stuff. So, you know, so I got to make some money. I'm good with my hands. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like the mother of necessity. You know, you, you needed money. And you knew that you had some sort of talent to do some things, and you know, like I say, the 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 the, the moon, the sun, everything aligned. You had a guy who needed a hundred Coke machines. You had someone who had a hundred to go. You were the middleman. You put it together, and you know, especially in Japan, I know they they really love their Coke machines and things of that nature. So I can definitely see how that took off for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Back then, it was amazing. You know, it's funny because. You know, I'm sitting here thinking about the other things I did. I have done so much. I was a masonry contractor. I was an excavation contractor. I built homes with another guy. I mean, I delivered sparkless water door to door. And all these little jobs, all those jobs, put everything together for me to be able to do pretty much anything. At the same time, not be afraid to do to take on a job. I think Rick's Restorations did that for me to where... You know, I used to be with something broke or one of the guys broke something. It's like, oh, my God, you know, that's a one of a kind, blah, blah, blah. Oh, my God. Well, I sort of figured out as you go through life, and I teach this to my, to my sons and daughter, that I don't care. I don't care what breaks or what happens. I mean, always can be fixed. It's always going to be fixed. I don't right. care if it's our economy. I don't care if our, our lives. I don't care. 
it's definitely fixable. So you got to go through life thinking, you know, that, oh, that's not the end of the world. Just get back up, and fire up and do it again or, or fix it, one or the other. And, and you know what? So many people like yourself that are successful, they say the same thing. You can't be afraid because if you're afraid to go out and have a business like yours, you're afraid to go out and be a singer, you're afraid to go out and be an actor or an athlete, yeah. then you're never going to have the chance yep. to see if you made it or not. And then you're like, well, I want, I should have, would have, could have. Now I'm 90 years old. I guess it's uh, pretty much it's over. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. That's a sad, for some of those, that's sad because they didn't need to be like that. They need, didn't need to go like that. Now, I, I'm assuming yeah. you can rebuild Coke machines with your eyes closed. Yeah, pretty much that's exactly what I say, too, because um, 90% of the Coke machines, I've done thousands of them. So, And I do. I include, that's my word. I can put them together with my eyes closed. I can paint underneath my legs in a windstorm. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> I have painted. I have painters going to paint booths, and all of a sudden there's dust in their paint, and I'm going, oh, my God. Watch this. Let me shoot out in this windstorm here. <laughs> you see, there's no dust in mine. How did you get dust in you? Now, I've had my fun, definitely. <laughs> out of all the items, and I know you do a lot of uh, one-off things. You know, I've seen you do motorcycles and uh, oil tankers. Um, you know, just a uh, like I, there was one time I saw, it was I forget what the the uh, uh, I, I might have been for uh, porn stars, but. Um, like a big gas station sign, like on the pole, something like 25, 30 feet in the air. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah but, that was lately on porn. Yeah. What, what, what's your favorite item to, to do? Like you say, okay, I, I love doing these. These are my, this is my favorite. So what's my favorite item? Not my, my item that it was my favorite to do. Um, right. Like you look forward to. Yeah. So, yeah. Every day I still do them. Uh, I love probably Coke machines more than gas pumps. And there's a reason because when I set out to do gas pumps, I was buying pumps for, I won't say $20 each. Yeah. I'm sorry. When I set out to do Coke machines, I was doing Coke machines for probably, you know, they were costing me about 20 bucks each. And now they're 2500 each, if not $5,000 each. It depends who you're buying from. Mm -hmm. But um, I kept saying back then, I don't care. It was like, the, you know, you can't you know, you know, equate it to like the stock market or something. But as far as an investment, something I bought for 20 and I had 200 of them back there. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, they jump up to a thousand dollars each the way they sit. You're not going to lose money on it. Anything that says, Coke on it, you're not going to lose money, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, that's why I love them so much. And they're also so, you know, stuff in the forties and fifties and thirties were built like with lo with love and appreciation by the American people. It was like, it is amazing how much pride people took in building their stuff. And when you tear something apart that they built, you really notice the workmanship and how it was done. So it's like, wow, look at this. Look at how they did that. I mean, you take something nowadays and you look at the way they put it together. They glued stuff together. And back there, you know, here they do it this way. Now I understand why they do what they do nowadays. But right. at the same time, it's just for money, not for pride. That's all the other was. I would take apart a Coke machine. You look underneath there and the motor on it says, um, made, all bolts spelled out, made in the United States of America. Now it don't even say that. Right. But it's like so prideful. So the Coke machines are my favorite. And, and, and what, what's your least favorite item when someone brings it in? You know, it's like, ah, oh, I, I hate doing these things. Typewriters. <laughs> um, oh. Adding machines. I There's a lot of things I just won't take anymore. Those are the most tedious, time-consuming, and then people don't understand. And, you know, nobody's going to spend like fifteen, two thousand dollars $2,000 on me to restore your typewriter. You know, it's like, but they don't understand what it takes to do one, nor do they understand what it takes to build one, you know? So they just know that it needs, it needs to look pretty again. So there's a lot of little things that are very tedious, time consuming that I just don't enjoy. Let's put it that way. And I, and I can see that. So now, and you kind of a little before to my question, what's the, what's the most favorite thing you've ever done? Okay. So, I mean, the, the best things I ever do and that I will always remember are things that are one of a kind, or maybe there's three left in the world. And when I do them, it's like, 
wow, you you just put together uh, <laughs> a space shoot, suit of the 19. I did this too. We did a NASA uh, jetpack that flew to the moon with Aldrin, and it was at the moon. So some guy finds it somewhere. It's amazing how they find this to stuff me, too. And then we, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. And then he, we restore the whole thing. Now this one we didn't restore to work because it was a little on the NASA level of it, but we restored it to look working and made it all beautiful again and everything. And the inside, I don't think it would actually ever work again because you needed special. There's chemicals and air and mm-hmm. different things that didn't happen. But anyways, that kind of stuff. But the bit, best one and my most favorite. Uh, piece that I did was on the show and it was um, so my dad take my ma- dad and mom took me to the air show all the time here in Las Vegas and it was at the Nellis Air Force Base and at, at the Nellis Air Force Base there was a uh, like a monument out front of an airplane and, and I can't remember what model it was anyways it was an airplane and basically that it was there because the pilot went in and died so it was in front of the Thunderbird Air Base. Mm-hmm. And I just remembered as a kid, always going in. So um, then one day, Kelly says, hey, um, the Thunderbirds called, and they want you to restore that old plane that was out front because they replaced it with a, with four new ones because four new, new guys went in like a few years before that. So here, I'm going to get to restore this thing that when I was like nine, ten years old, we would go in and see the air show. And I get to restore this, so I was like totally ecstatic. I'm like, awesome. Now, I'm a kid, so I'm thinking the thing's like 200 feet wide. It's a giant thing, you know, the last time I saw it. So uh, it wasn't that big. It was probably 12 to 15 foot. Mm-hmm. But it was all fiberglass. It was built, I want to say it was an F4, I think. Anyways, so we take it here. We build it. We uh, restore it. You know, it's all fiberglass. Do it to every detail. Uh, put it on its pole, back on its original pole. And get it there, and then we took it down to the base, and we um, set it all up, and I did it inside a hangar, and then all of a sudden we let all the airmen in to come see it that it was going to go in front of the base of the of the uh, Thunderbirds. Now keep in mind these Thunderbird guys are the most meticulous, perfect people you've ever seen in your life. The way they walk, the way they talk, the way they act, everything they do is is perfect in sync together. <laughs> so this is something that I want all my guys at the shop to understand. This is how we need to be. So I bring all my guys down and everything. So everybody's together and we're all down there and they come in. There was 200 of them that came in. The big, huge hangar at one time, they saw it. They started clapping. It was just, for me, it was emotional. It was just amazing. So uh, we did that. And then as I'm getting done and everything, I just did it just to do it. I wanted to do it. And then they asked me if I wanted to take a ride in an F-16. And, you know, I had to say, yeah. Of course. <laughs> so I had all, so that was my favorite episode one, or favorite, I shouldn't say episode, my favorite thing to restore. And at the same time, the favor that I got to allow me to fly in an F-16 was just, it was unreal. I did mock, I think, 9-3 or something like that. And I oh. didn't pass out or hurl. Oh. <laughs> good. I'm just getting dizzy thinking about that. It was it was insane. Well, here, let me tell you something. <laughs> I, if you ever put on one of those suits, now at that time I probably weighed two hundred. Okay. And I should have only weighed about one ninety because that suit was set for a little guy. <laughs> and I mean, my junk was all twisted up in it. My neck, I thought I was choking. It was like, but you're in this suit, in this seat. It's so tight. And then the guy's just wrapping you. He's left, right, twirling, twisting straight up. It was just, and when I got out, I couldn't even speak. I couldn't even speak because I was like so ecstatic and happy. And it was just, it was a great feeling. It was just amazing. <laughs> I, I could only yeah. imagine, you know, we, we, we have the air show uh, here. Uh, the Thunderbirds every year come here in Long Island on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, they do an air show over the beach. Oh, cool. And, uh, cool, cool. And it, and it was great. You know, they, they came this year, and luckily the weather broke. I mean, uh, you know, we, we've been having a bad stretch here. Uh, up until the Friday of Memorial Day weekend, we had weeks of beautiful, nice, sunny, no humidity weather. Since Memorial Day weekend, yeah. every day starts or ends with some sort of rain or clouds. Yeah, it's amazing what's going on with our weather. I'm sort of 
Yeah. I'm glad I only got 20 more years. Let's put it that way. <laughs> no, you got more than that. <laughs> you got more. You got, oh, yeah. That, that, dry, that, that, dry, that dry air has cured you. You got more than that. You're like a cured ham out there. <laughs> yeah, I'm immune to everything. Now, now, speaking of cured ham, you know, how did you get on, how, you know, how did Rick's Restoration get on the History Channel? You know, I, I know originally you, you, you're the expert for uh, Rick Harrison's uh, porn shop, which you have, you know, obviously they have porn yeah. stars the show. Now, did you know yeah. Rick before all this? I mean, since you guys are local or, or did you kind of just know of one another, never really had any business dealings, but how did you get on the show? Yeah, I did not. I knew of Rick. I knew, well, Rick was, you know, just another one of these kids that we were in Vegas, living in Vegas, and everybody knows everybody more or less. But, um, you know, I knew of the pawn shop and all that. But I I was selling, uh, I don't think, I wasn't with Kelly yet, or maybe I just got with her, but Tyler, my son, was, I said, man, I want, in fact, I know I wasn't with Kelly because I wanted to move. I wanted to move to Costa Rica. I wanted to go surfing. And I wanted to sell all these unrestored pieces that I had. I had just sort of said I was going to retire. And now this was yeah, it's like 10 years ago, at least 11 years ago. So, um, I wanted to retire. I was done. I was going to get out of here. And, um, Tyler put some on Craigslist, Craigslist. And then next thing you know, the pawn, either pawn production or the pawn starts called. And they said, well, you want to bring a piece down here and uh, sell it to us? we're interested in this and that. And so Tyler told me that. And I said, what do you mean? What is it? What's going on? A TV show wants to do what? So I said, no. And then, uh, I told my brother Ron, so he goes and takes something down, took a Coke machine down there <laughs> that bit him in the butt later because all of a sudden the show took off later. And then everybody saw Ron down there and said, well, Ron's your brother. But anyway, so later on, I kept saying, no, I don't want to do it. Next thing you know, I told them I was a restorer and this is what I restore stuff. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to be on a TV show just showing you my junk. I'm going to show you my good stuff finished. So they said, okay, well we want you to be an expert. How about being an expert? I said, okay. All right. The next thing you know, Rick Harrison shows up a full blown TV crew and, um, in my backyard and they want to film. And I was very overwhelming. I was shaking like a leaf. And I'm standing in the backyard. By the, we have a sort of a large shop in the backyard. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're filming. And uh, Rick's asking me questions. My mouth is dry. I'm like, can barely speak. I'm on camera. And uh, that's how it started. It was like, wow. So it started one. And this was for Rick's show only. For right. Long. So it was on. And then I did another one on. I did like 11. Different 11 pieces. Now, all of a sudden, I'm getting pretty good at it. Okay. They bring it over. My timing's good, meaning I get them finished in time for their filming. Dead, 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 dead. But then all of a sudden, I like go, I saw the reviews, and a lot of everybody was like interested in this stuff. And so did the History Channel. They saw. So the next thing they asked me if I wanted to show. And then I said, no, no, I could. I was just nervous, and I just didn't think I could do it. And at that time, Kelly's there, and we just, I don't know. Just we just didn't think it would be working out. Mm-hmm. So said no a few times. Next thing you know, I said yes, and then it just the ugliness started, <laughs> and it was show after show after show get bigger. As we're getting bigger here at the house, um, the first the city shows up says you can't do that there. Next the state shows up says you can't do that. You got to move. Then OSHA shows up says you can't do that here you got you got to give us seventy thousand. so then we have to move and get a bigger shop and then we have to have all these episodes done at a certain time it was it was rough but that's how i got on got in with rick harrison on the pawn stars first and then i you know started my own show at the same time exact same time as uh the pickers mike wolf did Mm -hmm. and then mike wolf and i were friends so Mike Wolf said, hey, well, let's do a pawn and polish. So then all three of us got together, and that was probably the largest and best episode that History Channel has ever put out on anything they've ever done. We were showing like 18 million people, which nowadays is unheard of. You'll get like 0. 0.5, 0. 
but now we had 18 million people seeing the episode. So it was really good. It was just like back in the day with I Love Lucy, we were like huge. So that's how it all started. And that's how it all ended. Just we, everybody just sort of dwindled out. Yeah. And I, I remember that episode because yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of, you know, your show and, and Rick's and, and, and Mike Wolf's. Yeah. Um, and, and it's yeah. great when you have that type of crossover because you all three of you complement one another. Yeah. You know, Mike, Mike's picking them, you're restoring them, and Rick is selling them. Yeah. So it, it really That's works. Right. And, it, and it's a perfect. shame. It was perfect. And, and it's a shame, unfortunately, that you're not, uh, you know, longer on the History Channel. So now, where are you? Where can my audience find your episodes? Where can they find new stuff you might be doing? What's going on with, with uh, Rick's restoration? Okay, so we, for a while, I was doing shows right before COVID. I was doing Rick shows with, at Pond again. I was still doing stuff, but I didn't have my own show. Um, History and I sort of disagreed on some stuff, and they went their way, and I went mine. And then, but at the same time, they wanted me on Rick Harrison's show so that I could boost the numbers. But anyways, and I did it for a while. And then after COVID hit, I said, well, I'm either going to just totally quit or Kelly started coming up with something where she said, well, let's do some Facebook, you know, shows. Let's right. do some, just start videoing and do stuff and I'll put it out there. So she, she tried, oh, I know what she tried to do, a, a subscription, paid subscription. And it didn't go over well. It didn't go over well. We did a lot of them and I thought they were good. But so come to find out my film crew saw it that used to be my film crew with uh, American Restoration. And they came in and they said, hey, well, let's do a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, what's that entail and how do we do that? He said, well, we'll be over here twice a week and we'll film and we'll do all the work as far as putting it out and getting it out there on the, uh, in the YouTube. So now, and it's for free, you don't have to pay for nothing. So it now is out on YouTube. It's called um, Restoration Rick. And uh, we sort of moved it the name, just keeping the restoration and keeping the Rick so people can still see it. We took all of our followers and allowed them to bump over or they can see it that way. Mm-hmm. And um, we've put out, it, one was out today. It's out every um, Monday uh, in the afternoon. And um, I think we've done three of them already. And they're really, really being received well. And all you got to do is look on YouTube, uh, Restoration Rick. I think even if you looked at Rick's restorations, it'd come up to a Rick Dale. But um, the uh, I enjoy it because when we were doing the TV show, it was all about the production crew and how they wanted to do it, which is how stuff works. Right. You know, it is what it is. And uh, they, you know, they had great numbers because of it, and so on and so on. But um, I all of the fans I felt like really wanted more process. And that's all they're getting right now on the YouTube channel. It's just process there. I mean, you've got the family in there, you know, you'll see all the family, you still see all the characters over there, but you're going to see how things are done and how hard they are and how many times I fail to, and I'm not perfect. I can make mistakes. And, but at the end result is finished and done and looking good. So I'm pretty proud of the stuff that's coming out and it's really of a high quality. Like, I mean, it's a, it's not like we just did them on our phones. It's straight up big camera, killer stuff. So it, I'm, I'm pretty proud of them. And once they get out there, I think it's going to change a lot of people's, I, I mean, or I should say a lot of networks idea, not people. I think it's just going to be networks. They're going to go, hey, why didn't we do that? Yeah, well, you know, it's a big thing, you know, when, when I, you know, watching your shows or, or I, I watch a lot of uh, uh, Motor Trend and, you know, all the different uh, car shows. There's a lot more, too, because, you know, yeah. you, you blink, blink, and then, you know, the, the car is back from um, uh, soda blasting and dipping, and it's all painted, and, and, and that's in a matter of seven minutes. But that takes weeks and hours and, and time, especially, you know, what you're doing. It, it, you know, you don't just strip down a, a Coke machine and repaint it and have it all done. But, you know, you don't get it at 8 in the morning. It's not dropped off at 8, and it's be, you know, so there's no pickup at 4. No. Yeah, no, there's no such thing. And it, uh, it, it, the people don't, yeah, they know it. They do know it, but it's like, why? I was sure would have liked to have seen how that happened, or I didn't see that. So, sort of, this thing is it's eight minutes long. It's no longer, you know, half hour episode. It's eight minutes. Right. Um, and sooner or later, they're going to throw them out there every day. But it's like they're trying to, 
every day you get a completion of something. So it's completed. And then the next is completed and it's completed. So instead of a show that, oh, you're literally going to binge watch and you're going to stand there and just look at it. And, and it just, for two days, you're just stuck to the TV. This thing, you can actually put it down, put it down, put it down. So we're going to try different, different stuff. Everybody's different. Everybody's got a phone though. And I think that's a recipe for success. Eight minutes, whatever, because much longer than that, people have other things to do. I mean, uh, as a guy, I think eight eight minutes is perfect, especially for a little bathroom run. You know, you can hide in there for eight, 10 minutes and you, you you catch a little TV, you know, when you, when you start, and like I said, in this day and age, you've got so much to watch, so much to see people just want to go from one. I know personally when I'm watching a clip and, and I already, you know, the clip's already been set up in my head. And, but the person's like, well, we're going to... Sh-. At that point, I've already turned it off. I'm like, I don't need to tell... I don't need you to tell me what you're going to do. I, you already told me the title. Just get to it already. So I, I think you'll be right. successful with the eight-minute clip, and especially when it comes out day by day. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm open. You know, it, it's not a... It's me. It's not about... It's not, I mean, a little bit it's about the money. It just is what it is. Keep right. you going, but... I really, I think the biggest thing that I uh, love about what I do and what I've learned about what I can do is teaching kids and stuff and keep people, you know, mainly people or children or younger people that are, don't know what to, they don't know what to do with their life or they don't know what they're going to do or they're waiting for something and knock them in the head. Right. Well, I have had, I mean, you figure 10 years ago this was going on. So anybody that's 20 years old now comes up to me and goes, oh, my God, my dad and I were watching the show. And that's why now, you know, I do this. It's like awesome. You know, it, it's just to me, it's just so fulfilling. It's awesome. Now, what bit of advice could you give those collectors who listen to my show when they're out there looking either for a Coke machine or for anything? What's like one general bit of advice you can give someone who likes to collect, uh, you know, antiques or what have you? Nowadays, go to places there's no TV or radio. Uh, <laughs> because how are you going to get a deal? Everybody between Mike and myself and Pawn, everything is overpriced. But, I mean, shop around. Shop around. The first antique shop you come up to, you know, you know, you really need to be able to keep looking and every day as you're looking and you're making it a, a habit or, or if you just like doing it on the weekend, just understand and research what you're looking for. You know, if you're, okay, I'm going to look for a 1933 jukebox and I, I, I'm all of a sudden I go to a place and, oh my God, I just found a Coke bottle on the thing. And you just got to research your stuff. Don't buy something that's reproduction. That happens all the time. Right, repops. Um, try to know what you're looking for and know. The thing is, is the price is just what you think. Because people call me all the time. What is this worth? What is this worth this? Well, you know what? I pay a lot different than you pay. And it depends what part of the country you're in. I have to pay shipping. You don't. You know, there's all kinds of factors that factor in. So the best thing to do is it's what for you. It's for you. It's what you, if you're a collector and that's what you enjoy, just do it. You know, that piece there, you float your boat and you, and you researched it enough to where you know that the person's not taking advantage of you and that's a good price for you. You're happy. You're gone. You did it. And don't ever just walk away if that's something you wanted because tomorrow it won't be there. Never pick up. It'll, it'll be gone. Somebody came in and they got it and you're going to cry. Exactly right. The, the time to buy, I think that's what I think that's what Mike Wolf says. The time to buy, it's when you see it. Yeah, yeah. If you think you need it, you better get it. Don't hesitate. Don't have buyer's remorse when you go out. Just yep, step in there and get her done. Now, Rick, how can my audience find, follow, and keep up with everything Rick Dale and Restoration Rick? Yeah, it's just all you got to do is go to restorationrick.com or rickrestorations.com either way you want to spell it and then that is where you can see everything that's going on I mean Kelly's ahead of the one and the film crew's ahead of the other and they're they're combined so you pretty much know everything I'm doing you type in Rick Dale you'll see quite a bit I'm doing anyway (laughs) Facebook, Twitter we've got them all you definitely do well Rick Dale of 
Restoration Rick, also of Rick's Restoration. Yeah. Thank you for being on the Big Fat Joey yeah. Show. It's been nothing but a pleasure. I wish you nothing but luck and success in all your endeavors, and we'll speak soon. Thank you very much, Joey. I appreciate it. All right. Have yourself a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Great interview, Sin. Great interview and great show, and I know that's one of your favorite shows. One of my favorite shows. Uh, you know, I like to follow Rick on YouTube as well, but it's fun to learn all the things and all the tricks of the trades that he has and he knows. So, ladies and gentlemen, up next is a song from our next artist interview, Michael Azar, his song, Few Breaths Away.
What a touching song to his mom. So great. So great. You know what? I'm going to let Michael speak about it. He's going to talk about it and he's going to explain to us where he gets his inspirations and the touching meaning behind the song for his mom. So up next is my interview with singer, songwriter, and artist, Michael Lazar. All right, everyone, let's welcome to the line, singer, songwriter, Michael Lazar. Michael, welcome to the Big Fat Joey Show. How are you? Hey, I'm really good. Thank you. How are you? Not bad, not bad. You know, plugging away during the summertime, enjoying myself, but I understand you're down in MIA, Miami? (laughs) That's right, I am. I am, I am. I made the I made the leap after 18 years in New York City. Wow, that's a good leap because you know what? This has been a, uh, a kind of a washout of a summer. I think the, the weatherman said we had 21 out of 31 days that rained somewhere during the day in the month of July. You know, it might not have been a full rainy day, but you had a little spritz in the morning or something in the afternoon. But in Miami, I know you guys get your rain, but those are over in a hot minute. Yeah, exactly. They come and they go, and then it's beautiful sun. That's part of the reason why I moved here. <laughs> I was I was a little bit done with that. You know, I appreciate the Northeast. I'm actually originally from Massachusetts, and then I moved to New York. So I feel like I did my time. Yes, you've you've, you've had your fair share <laughs> of a fair weather. Yeah, I'm no spring chicken, as they say. <laughs> so speaking <laughs> of. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You, you know, you're coming out of Massachusetts, you're, you're rolling into New York, and now you're in Miami. So give us a little uh, hindsight on who you are. Sure. Um, so basically, I grew up in a, a small town in Massachusetts. Not that small, Concord, kind of a famous old historic town. Um, and I was in love with uh, performing so from a very early age. So I was um, always performing on stage, but I also started playing piano at um, eight years old in the second grade, and I didn't stop all the way until I went to college. Um, so basically, I was always kind of wrapped up in, in some kind of art form, drawing as well. Um, but I never, like, you know, went to art class or anything. Um, anyways, that carried me uh, to NYU, which is why I went to New York City um, when I was 18, and I went to Tisch School of the Arts, specifically... Um, the musical theater performing studio called Cap 21, which incidentally is where Lady Gaga went. Mm. I don't mean to name drop. (laughs) Sorry, but she did. um, She's younger than me, which is even more embarrassing. But anyway, that's fine. She, um, no, she's incredible. So she was in the studio as well um, a couple years behind me. And um, that was an incredible place to really like, you know, own your craft as a performer and all that stuff. Um, And then I spent my 20s in New York City performing. Um, I did some national tours. I never actually did Broadway. Um, There came a point in my life where the, I don't know, the culture just didn't, um, I didn't agree with my my personal voice as an artist. You know, the audition scene, Mm -hmm. it just didn't, um, I wasn't, it's not that I couldn't take it, it's that I just, I, I grew tired of being judged every day um, by people who didn't know me. <clears throat> so, you know, and, and I forgot to mention that when I um, started college and um, I had like lunch breaks at the musical theater studio, that's really where I started writing songs. So I had all that piano background and um, it was a really cool style of piano where you learn by ear and stuff. So I, I felt like it, it kind of gave me the foundation to be able to write music. So, I started spending lunch breaks, working on new songs, and, and that's really where my journey of songwriting began when I was 18. And I carried that with me as well throughout my 20s, but I um, didn't, you know, um, fully embrace it until I learned how to produce my music when I when I was 30. Um, but uh, basically, that was my journey uh, to New York, and I um, I worked and I hustled and I did... Um, I did do solo shows. I did art shows as well. I mean, you know, I, I really am. Uh, I'm, the music is like such a huge part of me, but the, the visual art is another really huge side of me, which is why my Instagram, Art by Lazar, is kind of fun because it sort of dances between two art forms, the, the, the pop music and the pop art. So I think that's kind of cool. Um, but anyway, so um, that uh, was 
my experience in New York in my twenties and, um, in my, when I was 30, um, I had like this crazy life stuff up and like my mother passed away suddenly and she was like a huge, huge figure in my life. And so that was really rough. But I also like shortly before that met like the love of my life. I know it's kind of cheesy, but, um, I'm still with him now. And he, you know, we moved to Florida together. And so it was, and then, but then also like my, my house that I grew up in, like burnt to like blew up in a freak incident and burnt to the ground. This is all in the span of like a year and a half. Wow. So it was like this weird thing that happened. And I like really struggled to get out from that for a little while. I mean, I didn't like fall apart. And in the end, I <clears throat> ended up coming out of this, I think like a totally different person, like more confident and, and, and I cared less about, you know, what people thought. Um, and I believed more in myself and all that, but, um, that was a crazy period. So, um, and then I also fell into this, um, wonderful job selling photographs for a very famous photographer, um, named Peter Lick. And so that gave me sort of like a financial liberty that I had never had in my twenties for sure. Like doing national tours and working at diesel and stuff. Um, so it was with that, uh, freedom that I was finally able to like invest in teaching myself how to be a song producer. Then I didn't have to rely on, on producers either. I, I trusted myself. So <clears throat> basically the, the last remember, years, <laughs> um, six, seven, yes. <laughs> um, I didn't want to tell you my age, but you can do the math. Um, <laughs> so I, <laughs> uh, that's when I learned how to make it myself, the music, like real music, like that you could listen to on the radio. So, you know, before that, they all sounded like kind of like Broadway songs, you know, just me and the piano, right. sort of like what some of, I like to say Lady Gaga or Billy Joel's music can sound like when it's just that like jamming at the piano. Um, but my goal is to really take the Broadway out and make it accessible for, you know, thousands or whatever, millions of people, you know, if possible. So that it could appeal to, you know, broader audiences than just the Broadway people, you know. So that's what I did for the last seven years. And here I am now with my album. (laughs) So now your album, you're getting mass appeal. You have a new song that dropped uh, a few days ago, Few Breaths Away. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that came to be? Sure. Um, So Few Breaths Away is track three on my album, 5149. And, um... Few Breaths Away is a cautiously optimistic song with a really good hook and a driving beat that I think will get people from the start. And, um, you know, it was written um, on the keyboard, but electronically. So it has this really cool sort of, I think, fresh sound to it. But the the song is a cautiously optimistic song about, um, you know, mortality and and celebrating every day and and never giving up and, and all of that. And, and, and recognizing, because you have to recognize that, you know, we're, we're not going to be here forever and it could end, it could end today, it could end, we hope not, it could end, we don't know. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's a celebration of life. And then the, the second half of the song dives into celebration of love um, and the gift um, that love is, if, you, if you're fortunate enough to find it. So the song uh, spreads the message of, of love and gratitude, which is a huge part of the whole album. Um, anyway. Now you also have a couple of other songs that are out. Yes. So, um, I have capsule out as well, which is sort of an anthem for the frustrated during quarantine. It's not just about quarantine. It's about the feeling of being trapped and needing to get out or mm-hmm, needing mm-hmm. to be heard or needing to breathe um, with fresh air in your lungs. That sort of feeling of, um, of, of freedom that you get from just, you know, breaking the wall. So uh, that was my first single, uh, number one on the album. And then my second single was Good, Bad, and Crazy, which is track uh, six on 5149 and good bad and crazy is a is a great song that um uh, i hope you think it's great <laughs> it's, a, it's a song that uh, celebrates the uh good bad and ugly sides of life it it um it, it wants you to embrace 
the the highs and the lows sort of in a similar way to few breaths away but good bad and crazy is a little bit more edgy in that um i feel like it's very visual like you you see like the the the, the three sides of life kind of coming together to create this sort of like chaotic celebration um actually there was a uh, article uh, Eileen Shapiro from Get Out magazine. She's amazing. But she actually put it so well. I thought she said the song was like a. It, it gave her the feeling of being on a roller coaster, which I really appreciated. That. So. <laughs> well, definitely, that's what you know. A lot of music evokes you know different feelings in people, and a lot of times it is, is a little bit of a roller coaster ride. Now, your album, Fifty One Forty Nine, gotta give me some backstory. How, yeah. How'd you come up with that title? Okay, so 5149 isn't even a track name on the album, um, but 5149 is exactly the message of the album in totality. So if you add 51 plus 49, you get 100. Um, My angle with the album is a sort of half glass, half empty choosing, sorry, half full, half empty glass metaphor, um, choosing the half full. Uh, So basically, um, in my life, I feel like I have been blessed with so many wonderful things, but I've also gone through some crazy, awful things. Um, and the, the loss of my mom was was sudden, but it was also something that was taking its toll over years. So um, that was like a really, really heavy thing to, to take with me and to come out of, um, especially with the loss. It didn't really feel like it was resolved well, so I had to kind of reconcile that myself. So... The album is about going through everything that life has to offer. And if you can choose to err on the side of positivity, even if it's just like a little bit more so that you understand that life is going to throw you amazing things and it's going to throw you terrible things, things that you question, uh, things that you don't question because they're so amazing that you just go with it. And so the album, I think from start to finish, it's a pretty long album as far as like, um, I don't know, I think modern standards are. It's 15 songs. But because I didn't have any music out prior, I really felt like I needed to get all of them out in, in, in one go. And I think when you finish the album, for it, the last line is in my tribute song to my mom, which is Miss You. And the last, last thing you hear sort of fading out as the album closes, I'll keep trying to fight the darkness with the light. And my album cover is a 50-50 split between um, hot pink and, and cosmic blue. And there's this sort of dichotomy throughout the whole album. And when you listen to the album, you go through a lot of different styles. Um, and it, it, you feel a lot of emotions. And I hope that it, it, it inspires people to never lose hope. Never. And to, and to look at your life and find the blessings and hold on to them because it always could be worse. It always could be worse. So that, that really is the message from 5149. And that's true. Sometimes, yeah, most of the times, the grass is not always green around the other side. And now, finally, you also, you mentioned to me off air that you, you uh, did a cover of the Beach Boys song, A Kokomo. How did that come to be? How did that, that, how did that come to be? <laughs> oh, my gosh. So Kokomo... Um, is the only cover song on 5149. It's actually coming out this Friday. It'll be available everywhere to stream um, uh, on iTunes, Spotify, um, Deezer, the whole the whole thing. And um, it is, it's definitely, it comes at the end of the album. The, the album sort of feels like it's in three parts, 5, 10, and 15. And then the second, the, the last third is really about love. Um, I would say, and Kokomo is sort of just perfect for me having just moved to South Florida with my love of my life. And I know Florida is not perfect. Don't get me wrong. (laughs) However, there's still something to be said about just getting here finally and having space to create my music and my art. And I thought Kokomo fit in perfect. And um, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Actually, the cover is, is wild. Um, so I hope you tune into that. That'll be on Friday. Now, speaking of tuning in, how can my audience find, follow, keep up, and get all your songs and your album by Michael Lazar? 
Absolutely. All right. So it's pretty simple. So my Instagram is a really fun way to keep uh, up with what I'm doing. I have graphic videos that are explaining the album song by song, and I have artworks um, all sort of threaded together. So that's Art by Lazar. That's also my Twitter. So that's A-R-T-B-Y-L-A-Z-A-R. And uh, you can track all of my singles leading up to the album drop on October 8th there, as well as Twitter, um, also Art by Lazar. And then um, my website, where you can see my graphic videos for the songs that I've put um, out so far, um, as well as articles uh, and various press and, and things like that. That's michaellazarmusic.com. So that's M I C H A E L L A Z A R M U S I C dot com. That's also the name of my Facebook page, Michael Lazar Music. So if you can remember Art by Lazar, and you can remember Michael is our music, you're good. And don't forget to go uh, to whatever music streaming service that you um, subscribe to and just type in my name, Michael is I have three singles out uh, for this Friday, and um, I'm really excited. I'm excited. <laughs> well, singer-songwriter Michael is our, thank you for being on the Big Fat Joey Show. I wish you nothing but luck and success in all that you do, and we'll speak soon. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. I really am. All right, buddy. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You know, since a lot of our artists get their inspiration from things that happen to them in life. I totally agree, and I'm so impressed by all these indie artists. Yeah, I mean, you know, unfortunately, sometimes tragedy brings out the best in people and, and, and their creative um, juices, but it's great that they're able to have an outlet to send out their emotions, you know, let their heart uh, come forward. And it's great that they have that ability. So with that, we're also going to be hearing his take on the old school classic song Kokomo from the Beach Boys. But before we get to that, tick tock, tick tock, it's that time again on the clock. Everyone, this is Big Fat Joey. Big Fat Joey show here with Sin, reminding everyone to make, make every, every sandwich, sandwich count. count. Peace. Peace. Aruba, Jamaica, ooh, I want to take ya to Bermuda, Bahama, come on pretty mama, Key Largo, Montego, baby, why don't we go, Jamaica, ooh, I want to take ya off the Florida Keys, there's a place called Kokomo, that's where you want to go to get away. From it all Bodies in the sand Tropical drink melting in your hand We'll be falling in love To the rhythm of a steel drum band Way down in Coco Aruba, Jamaica Ooh, I wanna take you to Bermuda Bahama, come on pretty mama Key Largo